Good afternoon, YouTube. Welcome back to Studio B21. Once again, my name is Ryan. This. Hi, I'm, I'm sexy. Chef Nino. Full name reveal at 50,000 subscribers, of course. Of course. And we wanted to try reacting to something near and dear to our hearts. I've... I've been found. I've found the channel I quite like. Mister Nino has not seen it yet, as far as I know. Um, but there's a gentleman by the name of Alexander in Europe who goes to three Michelin star restaurants mm -hmm. and gives an honest review. He's the owner of a one star place in Norway. Personally, Which is also I also amazing. Yeah. I don't know how he has the money to go to all these restaurants. That's a video for another time. Money wandering. <laughs> No, but but as a as a chef, you go to other places that are good. Oh, of course. Right? Like the only way to make good food is to taste good food. And you the know? only way to get better is to have something better to well, strive for. Thing, right? It's just like, you, you don't know where you're going to get inspired in but, any artistry or any creative endeavor, right? So it's like... But this brings me to a question that I'll ask... Further on in the video, how far is too far in the world of fine dining? How far until we take the art and it's replaced by pure science with no love, no passion, in my well, opinion? Yeah, that's well, that's on your opinion, right? It's like, how do you distinguish what's art and what's good? Exactly. Right? And like... To a foodie, it might be amazing. To like the layman, it's like you're still trying to figure out why you're getting 18 courses of one bite each, right? And you're spending a thousand euros for that. A thousand euros, which is like roughly, let's say, 250, 100. No, that's <laughs> like 1500 Canadian. 1500. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's my like guess. That. Anyways, thank you for sticking with us for now. And without further ado, on to the video. We are back in Copenhagen for the restaurant that turned Denmark into a gastronation. Its name is Noma. Arguably the best restaurant in the world. We're closed for good at the end of 2024. So, side note. It says they are closing for good. This in the mod this in today's date, March 3rd, 2024, has proven. I believe to be somewhat of a false narrative. They have recently announced that they are going back to Kyoto, Japan, which they went to last year and did a pop-up at the Ace Hotel. They are going to do another pop-up and then, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but then they will be coming back to Norway to do their fish season. So maybe they'll open a new location. Maybe it's the building, but the concept of Noma will not close. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Opened in 2003, it got a lot of attention in a weird way. From a document, I know, weird, right? It was called the Manifesto of the New Nordic Kitchen. Written by food activist and entrepreneur Klaus Meyer, with a handful of Scandinavian chefs, it redefined the rules for Nordic cooking. Basically, it says, New Nordic cuisine must keep traditional methods and use ingredients that are in season. On the other hand, it needs to innovate, be passionate and create with new ways to use traditional Nordic foods. See, After it's just... like before Noma, like the Nordic countries, whether it be Nor Norway, Finland, Sweden, they weren't on the food map. When Very you, much so, yes. when, you, when you thought of like good food, you always think of France. France. England. You Germany. Know, Germany. Japan for sushi, obviously. Yeah, and to a lesser extent, like Thai cooking, which is like awesome street food. But when you think, like, let's get, go to the best restaurant in the world, like, back in my day, you never thought, like, yeah, let's go to Norway. Yeah. You know? Or even nowadays with Machu Picchu and, like, Peru and all that amazing stuff they're doing there. But, yeah. He has been to Centro in Peru, the number one right now. So, yeah. That's another video for another time, though. They, they presented at the Nordic stuff. Kitchen Symposium, people freaked out. And the concept caught on like wildfire. It would change not only Denmark, but the whole region. 
inspiring dozens of chefs and pushing Scandinavia into the world's culinary spotlight. And standing center stage was René Redzepi, head chef of Noma. When he was 15, René dropped out of high school and signed up for cooking school. After he trained as an apprentice at a local Michelin star restaurant called Pierre André. From there, he spent time cooking in France and then in Spain, where he worked at Abu. He returned to Copenhagen and took a position at Kong Han, but took a break to spend a season at the French Laundry alongside Thomas Keller. In the... build up your culinary repertoire. For those, right. for those also not familiar with the history of cooking as it is, El Bui back in, what was it, the early 2000s or even the mid-1990s mm -hmm. was revolutionary as a Michelin star restaurant. For the simple... For one of thing, their simple way of discovering how to sphere different liquids, the olive oil spheres, almost like little liquid caviars, which was... The gastro... gastro... Uh, it was essentially... Molecular gastronomy, yes. Molec it was a great start to the molecular gastro gastronomic era, and... Dan Charlie Trotter in Chicago. I would equate El Bui to almost the Thomas Edison of the restaurant world having that spark to bring light into the new age of cooking. Yeah, one of the best restaurants in the world. Napa Valley. In 2002, the 24-year-old chef was approached by Klaus Meyer, who offered him the opportunity of a lifetime. Head chef of the brand new Noma. The name Noma comes from a mix of two Danish words. Nordisk, which means Nordic, and Mad, which means food. They opened in 2003. Mad. In fact, the first few years were an uphill battle. Turns out, Danish people were not so adventurous with their food. They were used to the traditional dishes like roast pork and potatoes, and left the local food landscape unexplored. For example, out of 55... So that's one other thing with working in the kitchen. Especially being such a revolutionary, is it's not going to happen overnight. Imagine trying to change the flavor profiles of people who have been steeped in a Nordic tradition since, let's be honest, probably the Vikings, for God's sake. Well, yeah, they like their pickled fish. They like their buns flesh, and you know, it's like the the what's that? that, that Ludvisk or Ludvisk? Ludvisk. Ludvisk. Lud Ludvisk. Not Henrik Lund Not Henrik Lundqvist. Great goalie, but no, you know. He's a great one. Yeah, yeah he's a great one. <laughs> There were berries in the region, people ate only seven. Red to believe that changing what people eat would not happen overnight. Right. But so many wondered if it was possible you at all. Need a lot of money to change people. After simmering for a few years, things finally started to heat years, up. By 2006, it reached a rolling boil. Sustainability, simplicity, and freshness became the order of the day. Three years in a row, from 2010 to 2012, Noma was named the best restaurant in the world. They would go to claim the number one spot a total of five times. Something that's been done only once before by Abui in Spain. Despite all their success, the Michelin Guide had Noma to two stars for more than a decade. Finally, in 2021... Now, the Michelin Guide itself, that could be a topic for another video, more like a sit-down, open-table discussion. And the validity of it? The validity, yes. I believe it... I am. I used to love it. I grew up when I went to France for a little bit, a little, little, little bit, just like only two weeks. But I got the opportunity to go to a Michelin star, three Michelin star restaurant for lunch. Ooh. Like this is me, like fresh in college, fresh out of college, essentially, just to eat. And yeah, it was great. And but you have, and then but just over the years with the advancement of food and. I guess also kind of tying into a, mon a monopolyic situation. How can one thing govern the entire culinary industry? Uh, absolutely, without thing. You've been yeah. hearing about this. This is the Bible. This is the Bible, essentially. Why is a tire company judging what's good and bad in the culinary world and telling us what's good, what's bad, what are their standards, and like, yeah. And one. how does one one secret inspector speak for the entire population? Yeah. But uh, that yeah. is a conversation for another time. Buy your tires brand new, Michelin. Shout out Michelin. They gave Noma the third. So now that you know how special this place is, I have some bad news. 
This year is your last chance to try Noma. At the end of 2024, Noma will close its door for good. It's not the first time Chef Recipe has made such a bold move. In 2012, Noma closed to open a pop-up in London. In 2015, they did the same. This time in Japan. In 2016, it was Australia. 2017, Mexico. In 2016... The Mexico pop-up was when me and, uh, me and Chef 90 were working at Scotiabank Arena, formerly known as Air Canada Centre, with you, Suede, the creator of this channel. And... I was partnered with Chef 90 on my station, and you might not remember, but I was following Rene Rezepi on Instagram at that point, mm -hmm. and every day I would be looking at the daily dispatch of ingredients of all the mangoes, the, remember the octopus that they cooked underground in like, oh, yeah. the fucking beach? That shit, like, to me, it helped with my love of food, it made me want to explore more, and you know, keep me going in the industry. So, yeah. I cut the pig. Still, they took a year off. And in 2018, reopened in the current building as Noma 2.0. Then during COVID, they closed completely and became a burger bar. <laughs> so, no up, Chef <laughs> Recipe had... Now that's that, cool. that is smart as hell. Yeah. Imagine three Michelin star place going into a burger bar because the world shut down, essentially. But... In, that's the thing. You still need money as an overhead, right? So well, they survived years with the the Nordic environment. The Nordic winters. You know, just like not accepting what they're doing, how revolutionary it is. Until like, you know what? Holy crap! What they're doing is amazing, and yeah, we'll start buying this, and then but it's people also, from all over the world were coming there. But it's all. But that to your point, you. What you, when what you're doing is so revolutionary, you have a guarantee that people will brave a Nordic snowstorm in order to come eat your food. Yeah, but... You have the guarantee. But that's the thing. It's like, you need those people to be brave and try shit out. Agreed. Right? You need people to come out and say, I'll try something new and I'm willing to spend my money on it. Agreed. That's the thing. Something else up his sleeve. What could it be? We arrive... At Noman's Garden Village. We didn't see any signs, just a collection of small buildings, greenhouses, and raised beds. We arrive at the main building covered in deer antlers, a sign of what's Far to come. Stepping in, in, we are met with this. Hello from everybody. What a reception. Heartwarming from the start. Love it. The staff are energetic and excited to talk. That's when I learn we are in for something really special. It's something I rarely get to experience when dining abroad. A server that can speak my mother tongue. This is Saboc and he speaks Hungarian. And because of him, I know this is going to be a special night. Welcoming us to the table is this guinea fowl in a thick salt crust. We are also presented with an outrageous amount of mushrooms that are... I just want to make a point to the whole restaurant. When you go to a high-end restaurant, you're not just buying food. You're buying the show. You're buying the experience. Right? You're buying memories that will last you a lifetime. Depending on how much wine you drink, though, those memories could be very short. Well, that's the thing, right? <laughs> it's just like you're paying for the ambiance. You're paying for the people who are treating you, right? You're the professionalism of the people. You're paying to enjoy the company in there. And for most people, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Yes. Right? It's like Ryan remembers that three-star lunch, like, vividly. So it's just like, when you do go to a restaurant, most good restaurants will try to make your dining experience a memorable one, you know, and to make it so you could remember the feeling that you had there. And it is a subject for another video, but it will, we will talk upon restaurants going above and beyond for example the person i'm person we're watching right now he went to 11 madison park in new york and they talk about there how they have an entire division of their restaurant meant to craft the dinner to your liking based off of a story of when a group of people were dining there and the waiter learned that all they ever really they were happy with the meal 
but the one true thing that they missed about going to New York and that they hadn't had the chance to experience was a streetcar hot dog. Oh, like the bear. The bear. Like the fucking streetcar hot dog. Off the street, off the cart, mustard, sauerkraut, whatever. And so what they did was they literally went out to the street cart, bought five, played it up nice, and brought it out as a new course. That's cool. That's and that's about, going above and that's beyond. Amazing. That's going That's right? going to the moon and back in three Michelin star standards, for God's sake. So now they have people there. So once you make the reservation, they will look at your entire social media profile to determine what you like and how to craft the meal around what you like. So, so they're social media stalking you. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But that being said, if you don't go to your local restaurant and make your own menu. Never. Don't don't go. It's like, can I take this fish dish and with that sauce and make something completely new like you know better than the chef that es- actually made it. Especially during the dinner rush. No, Fuck you if that. you do that. <laughs> going to make their way back to the table later. As you can see, everything is out in the open, almost begging you to ask about it. Gone are the traditional white tablecloths. In its place is warm Scandinavian design, using all natural materials, mostly wood. The staff uniforms are more function than fashion, but by no means sloppy. It helps to set the atmosphere to informal and relaxed. Noma is open just four days a week from Tuesday to Friday and it's open for lunch and dinner. There are 40 seats, but four of them are reserved for students to try the gourmet experience at a lower cost. If you are by yourself, you are still... How he... That one statement, how they keep four seats open in their restaurant at a reduced price for students. Students! To be able to come and dine at the best restaurant in the world over five years. To be able to both show you what you might be able to accomplish, but also to show you just how vast the world is and how hard you are going to have to work if you hope to be anywhere near what they are doing. Well, what do you mean by students? The culinary students? Or the yeah, culinary students. 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 Like a university student? What do, what they, do you mean as far from what I know, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but... Copenhagen is now turning into a massive culinary school district because of all the restaurants and the oh, new no, surge of co- of Danish and Nordic food in the world. They are they more than likely are being able to generate more culinary industry classes tailored to the new age of cooking, I guess. Okay. That's so cool. It is. That's amazing. It's beyond welcome. Amazing. You can reserve a seat at the share table and make new friends while you experience a food paradise. The menu is divided into three teams, showcasing food seasons and its best ingredients. From January to June, it's ocean season. July to September is vegetable season. October to December is game and forest season. That's what we are trying today. The menu will set you back 535 euros, Jesus. but you are also expected to choose a drink pairing. The wine package goes for 280 euros, while the juice pairing is 250. For me, the choice is easy. Juice. Firstly, the oh. palette is nope. a sparkling wine from Tripoli. Suddenly, the menu <laughs> begins. Here, they have yeah. done away with the little bites and amos bushes and dive straight in. First is guinea fowl, juicy and tender breast with a dipping sauce of hazelnut milk, rendered fat, and koji. On the side is caramelized skin roasted over charcoal, and guinea fowl egg with nettles. It looks and smells good, but for taste and texture, I was hoping for some acid and some crunch. Next at the table, one large pear. It's straight of the tree, just how I like it, almost. Watch this. This is pear salad with sea Oh my god. It is really good and really fresh. And I also really love the presentation. Next is something totally unique. What do you think it is? In a million years, you would never guess. You have heard of Take the- Take a guess. Hmm? Take a guess, Nino. Some kind of drink. Some kombucha. Probiotic drink called kombucha. This is what they use for fermentation. It's called SCOBY, and it stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. 
I know how it sounds, but it was brilliant. It's cultivated with cranberry tea, brushed with large oil, and drizzled with bergamot. Yeah. It's presented beautifully on a solid chunk of clear ice. Oh, that's cool. And it's now this is where it kind of loses me, to be honest with you, because really? I don't, I don't know. It's to me, I that's something I'm unfamiliar with, first of all. So okay, but to me, paying. I don't know. It's like paying 535 well, euros for... What, 585? Yeah. For, for SCOBY? Yeah. But for you... something that looks like, honestly, a breast implant. But I'm familiar with SCOBY. I, I'm, it's like I tried to make my own SCOBY. So I know of the formation of it. Mm. It's a symbiotic bacterial and yeast but, thing. And that is kind of where my mindset goes of what it how when do we separate science from art <laughs> it's like what do you mean by that question where it's like i see that as just like okay scoby it's it's the mother to make more kombucha it's basically your fermented uh teas mm -hmm. right your your sparkling teas they, they have at bougie shops or anywhere in Toronto nowadays, but but you could use that. I never thought that's always been like a product you put away. But to actually take that and use it as the center of a dish, yeah, like, on its own, it's served on a clear chunk of ice. That's what they were saying. Well, it's just it's scoby, and it's like my thought was like, well, they use nutritional yeast. Yeah, you know, we use it as garnish for the most part. But to make that a centerpiece, like okay. <laughs> it's like that's kind of cool. I I thought it was cool. You know, it's like I maybe that maybe that's like maybe that's my vanillaness. Maybe that's me just being weirded out by something different. Cause in my mind's eye, when I picture three Michelin star, I picture the guinea fowl at the start, like uh, the pear salad, even. But something that to me just looks like a little plastic chip on a plate. That's kind of going beyond what I'm used to and what I'm more comfortable with. Well, I think that's why you go to these type of places. That's why they're like, it's the innovativeness of it. That, exactly. That pushes the normal consumer the, and the worldwide like thinking of food. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like for me, I was like, I would never use scoby as a dish. Yeah. Right. But to actually put it on and figure out a way to actually serve it. Because I know that they like Noma likes their fermentations. They like, have a massive you know, fermentation program. I, I know they like their pickles. I know like they do a lot of, you know, just gathering and serving. You yeah. Know? It's like, I'll take a walk on the beach and gather seaweed and see what, what else is there that's edible, you know. And they encourage their cooks to do so and just play with the dishes. But, exactly. But with this, like, I think it's cool. <laughs> I think Juicy and chewy, in a good way. On the side is fabulous stuffed hip berry. With this dish, the kitchen is really flexing their Actually, science muscles, proving that Noma is as much research institute yes. as it is restaurant. Partnered with this dish is also something unconventional. A 2019 Quotillon de Dame from Jean Yves Perron. This one is a real sniffer. It is, smells it, it, it amazing. Is this is a skin right? contact wine, also it's called a, orange it's a, it's wine. Animal. To make it, they use the skins, the seeds, and sometimes even the stems. What comes out is a complex, deep, and mineral it's wine. Lower in alcohol, it's but it's higher in antioxidants. So it's even healthier than regular wine. Next, pumpkin pie. It's interesting how they follow up an adventurous dish with something common. It's good, and the presentation is great. But in terms of creativity and taste, it's a little step back compared to the previous dish. Next, a bowl of walnuts. Sounds pretty basic, and it is. But it's also amazing. Each fall, Noma's beekeeper brings fresh walnuts from his tree. And each year, they find a way to incorporate them into the menu. Part of the daily prep work at Noma includes cracking the shells and carefully peeling the skin away to read what tender meat of the walnut. It's paired with a balanced and full-body Japanese sake served warm. Up next, this cherry leaf sandwich. But it's more like an ice cream sandwich. It's crispy cherry leaves with foamy goat cheese ice cream. They make things really interesting by adding white truffle from Piedmont. Hey, that's not Danish. That's cheating. 
technically. Yes, but I was happy they did it. It set up a wonderful balance of flavor and texture. Umami, salty, sweet, creamy, light and crunchy. One of the best of the meal so far. Speaking of things I like, the interior here is super inviting. And the atmosphere created by the staff is something special. And it's clear they are not trying to impress. They are just doing their thing. Nothing fancy or high-end. That said, I love a nice class. And wish I had one. The rest is brilliant. See, the thing is, with higher-end gross, uh, like restaurants, you'll get a lot of like-minded people. Yes. You get people who are there, who love food, who love, love being in company. And they have that same goal of making good food, of making your, your experience Making sure like you have the best amazing, service. You know? And that's... That's the thing I, I love about the industry, where it's just like, if you could find that passion, which is rare for some people, and to find other people with the same passion and like are willing to help you get to that goal. Willing to feed off and grow your ideas. Yeah, and just play off each other. And just like, where it's like, it's not even work anymore, it's play. And for most of these guys at this restaurant, it is play because they're not getting paid. Exactly. You know, because I worked at a lot of restaurants where I didn't get paid, where they say, oh, I'll pay you an experience. But at the same time, it's like, I've got a hell of a lot of experience. You do. You know, I've, I've played with a lot of things. I've, a lot of things have entered this mouth, which is awesome. You know, and it's like all these techniques, like just, you know, butchering my own, you know, meat you know catching my own fish or yep. like growing my own vegetables or getting that start to finish then burying a pig or yeah you know designing a plate in your head and executing it out start to finish yeah exactly even the whole costing thing which is not great but yeah but just to be in that environment to find some people you could really bond with it's a one in a million feeling yeah Our next wine is from French producer, who is a former musician turned winemaker producing unfiltered wine. This one is an acidic Chenin that is absolutely vibrant. It's paired with wild boar belly, apple and lingonberry. Just look at that fat. You know what that means. Fat means flavor. And this dish has a lot of it. This is an outstanding one. Chef Rennie... One of those things where it probably, it's probably one of those things where it's like a quick sear? It's or? a very quick sear, more oh, than likely. Blowtorch, maybe? Or it's just... probably straight blowtorch, yeah, just to kill any little bacteria it has on it, but still give you the raw flavor. Yeah, because it, it looks like kind of seared, but it's like it hasn't fat, been that rendered. That fat was fat. <laughs> it hasn't been rendered that much. Nope. <laughs> no. Recipe. So, sorry, even to that, why do you think it would have been better to have that boar course at the start, almost like a Almost like a tataki or a tart, not a tartare, but a that carpaccio. Like that's, that's in the middle. That's, yeah, like there's like four dishes. Four, four. No, that's that's like se that's like seven dishes in, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, maybe Wouldn't like, it be better, like more near the front as a starter, starter, or would that uh, be too heavy? Do you think? I think fat would coat the mouth more Fair. and will linger on more, right? I feel like that fat would go great with the pear salad, though. It would, but you also have the lingonberries exactly. and the berries. You know, he has come to show us something. Uh, At first, yourself. I think it's pork belly, but turns out it's Kobe. Remember that dish we had earlier? This is where it started from. I'm not sure I needed to see or smell that, but when a super chef casually drops by your table just to show you something in a huge jar, it's pretty cool. Next, we have gelatin made with mushroom. On top is a ring of fresh sunflower seeds and in the middle, whipped cream. Interesting and pleasant texture with a heavy umami flavor. Coming up, we have a clever dish that will make <laughs> you curious or turn your stomach. But that's what you get in Michelin star quality. <laughs> I, oh, want, yeah. I want to know what type of mushrooms, whether it was wild Danish or was there, or whether, you know, even adding like dried porcini in there. Remember we used to make like dried, porti dried porcini, porcini stock? Yeah. Stock for like risotto, like that, you add gelatin into that, the flavor on that would just be well, yeah, like a punch to the face. With the porcinis and the dried shiitake. Yeah. And my trick was I used the roasted mushroom juices. Yeah. threw it in there. But yeah. 
It's an omelette made with reindeer brain. Starts with a thin egg pancake and pheasant garum with kelp salt, then fold it around the filling. That filling has a healthy amount of reindeer brain. Sounds weird, but actually it has a soft, creamy texture like custard. Yep. It's delightfully acidic with exciting flavors. It's served in a foamy, buttery pheasant garum sauce. Genius! I loved every Most bite. Go for it just Our next wine is a 2017 Pinot Noir. It's a year for this wine and features dark fruit and light tannins. To go with it is a wild mushroom ragu. It's salted mushrooms and herb salad with crispy pieces of chestnut served in a beeswax bowl. Very nice. Our next course is another one gets people talking or leaves them speechless. Reindeer tongue. It's pan fried in butter and thyme until medium rare and served on a sharpened reindeer antler. It's served with a special herb butter sauce made with oxidized wine. I'll tell you one thing. I'm definitely stealing that antler. <laughs> Good lord. Because, like, the tongue is such a tough piece of meat. You figured, you, you yeah. figured they would need to, like, braise it or slow cook it yeah, for to, like, just hours, feel... right? To just release the fiber, the muscly fibers Maybe of it, if right? Maybe if it's a thinner cut, then you could probably get away with it. By the look of it, it seems like a pretty thin cut. Almost, like yeah. I said, almost tataki style. Yeah. A Noma Project vinegar and pine salt. The tongue was chewy but tender and full of meaty flavor. Exceptional. Our again, next wine is something really different. It's called chefs. Gabriel's wine and it's made that in the country of Georgia. It right. It's made from Saparavi grape. Maybe and this wine is completely handmade using a centuries old method of aging in clay pots under the ground. Our next is our main course. Grilled fallow deer and autumn pickles in horseradish sauce. With it is city loaf sordo bread from the hard bagheri, one of Chef Recipe's side projects. The deer was spot on and this bread is something else. Next is dessert, starting with pine resin jelly. This is one of the creations yep. from the test kitchen. Starting with pine resin, first they soak it and then cook it for hours with wine and sugar, and then form it into little lumps. After they soak it again, it balloons to 10 times the size and becomes this jelly. It has a unique texture and a slightly pine cone flavor. Our next- okay. What do you think about that one? <laughs> Uh, it's the pine resin. Yeah. Imagine oh. the flavor of, like, the pine needles. It's like, to me, they have to do that. They have to execute the flavor on that perfectly or even dumb it down a little. I think it's dumbed down a lot. Because, yeah. Because, like... With all the sugar and wine? Yeah, because, like, they have to dumb that down. Otherwise, it's... You're basically Pure turpentine. bitter. Yeah, it's like, good lord. Exactly. Well, yeah. Lick your baseball bat. Next dessert is an ice cream spaghetti made from fresh hazelnuts and hazelnut oil, candied chanterelles and berries. This was really good. Finally, we have three final sweets. Woodruff and pine caramel, candied pine cone cooked in sugar, and finally a chocolate sauce with a sumac flour. The flour is used as a sponge to eat the chocolate and gives it an acidic kick. This was my favorite. After our meal, our generous waiter, Sabolj, gives us the grand tour. We see everything, no door goes unopened. When all is said and done, we make our way to the door. They say goodbye like they said hello with all hands on deck and present us a parting gift from Noma Project on the way out. Our total for today is just under 2,000 euro for two people. What a great experience. Sadly, it cannot be had for much longer. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up actually. I want to look that up because two thousand euro. Yeah. So according to the Google the 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 Google. The Google. On the interwebs. One euro equals one point four eight Canadian dollars. Oh god, I can't nope, see it. Nope, nope, nope. So is. we put in 2,000. 2,000 and one euros. Fuck it. Why not? This man paid three grand Canadian for a dinner with wine. And, and you're eating chewy, <laughs> chewy rain bear tongue, some scoby, which they took off, you know, a tea jar. Yep. They, they grabbed off of my hand, you know. And a little thing of mushroom jelly, some pine resin. 
which yeah, get, he... which brings me to another point at the Michelin stuff. Like, how much is too much for the price you're paying? <laughs> Depends on your perspective. Exactly. Right. My perspective is as a, as the guy in the back of the house running things. I want to get away with as much as I can. Oh, exactly. <laughs> you know, making the bed with the guy beside me. Watch this. Watch this. Pine resin. And jelly. Just soak it in wine and sugar. See, see, see that? The pine tree leaking outside? Go grab, lick it. Go, go lick it. Go, hmm? go grab that. Throw it in the friggin' pot. I'll serve it tonight. No, 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 no. Trust me. Trust me. I'll serve it tonight. They'll love it. Yeah? But chef, you're, you're making us cut up Deer tongue very thin, and it's like, want that be true? Yes. Yes. Let's get away with that stuff. You know? All in the name of food. But at the second time, it's just like, if you have that money, what are you got to spend that money on? Exactly. Right? For, it, us, for us people, it's a dream to have that much money to spend. Well, that's the thing. You have to put yourself in that mindset of where it's like, I have this money to spend, how am I going to spend it? It's more the clock is ticking. I've been Next here, year, I've NOMA it. will be it's normal. Off the list. We found the out its fate in drink. January 2024. From 2025, NOMA will no longer serve as a restaurant. It will be used as a test kitchen, and they will sell the products online. Capital. Although Chef Recipe didn't spill the beans, That's I have no doubt That's that it. he will surprise us somehow. And, day, and NOMA will continue in some shape right. or form. What can I say about this experience? I've been here before, but this time was a game changer. To be served in Hungarian, this was a first for me. I actually got to experience a three Michelin star in my mother tongue. It was kind of magical. The only thing I wasn't crazy about was the all natural wine pairing. It was a really good selection made by the sommelier, but natural wines just aren't my thing. When I look at Noma as a restaurant, I wouldn't say it is my favorite. When I see it as a movement that made a lasting impact on a lot of people, it has no equal. And not just that in Denmark, but on yeah. the world of gastronomy and beyond. It inspires and shows the way, and this will continue on. Although the restaurant as we know it will say goodbye, their way of thinking is not going anywhere. And that does it for this episode. Thank you for joining There's me. If you like... To, to be an inspiration to people. Agreed. Right? To actually have the financial backing and the social backing to do wild and adventurous stuff. You know? Where it's like, you know what? We trust you. Do your thing. Wow us. Yep. You know? And then to get to that level, you have to be very lucky. You have to be very good. And you have to have a lot of you people have follow to be, you. You have to be almost insane as well in order to think oh, of... guaranteed. In order to think of, why don't I... Like you said, why don't I serve pine resin to millionaires, potentially? You know, it's like... Oh. Every time I think of pine resin, think of baseball bats, and it's like, you lick your glove to, to put it on, this is like, you know, that little pine resin. The tannin, of, the tannin like, of your glove drying out your and, tongue? And it's like, this jelly. Fuck jelly. I'm just like, oh my god, that just sticks in my uh, craw. <laughs> like, I know. But, I know, man. But at the same time, amazing, right? Can I get your opinion on how he reviewed it? Like, I love how... This is obviously a later video on his channel. I've been watching from the beginning. He's improved on his quality of a lot. But I like how he is impartial. He likes... I like when he said... That he says he doesn't like something at some point. Or the one dish where he's like this was a step back or this was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Well, he's honest. Yeah, he's honest. You, There's nothing worse than people going like, it was perfect, when it obviously wasn't perfect. Well, it could be. I had perfect restaurant experiences. You know, it's like, but at the same time, it's, you have to understand your position as an influencer or, a, yep. you know, a reviewer. Where you're not eating just for yourself. Exactly. You're eating yeah. for the audience as well. That's the thing. But I think like... he does that in a very good way. He well, knows yeah. he's eating for the audience. He describes the flavor profiles very vividly. Yeah. Yeah. Like I used to tease my sisters. Like, we'll share it, but I'll eat it all, and I'll describe it to you as I'm eating it. So it's like we're both eating. Amazing. <laughs>
Thank you guys so much for, for joining us. Please drop a comment down below. Tell us what you think of it. Tell us what you think we should review next. Give us comments, concerns, questions, confessions of what you think we can do and what we can do better. Thank you very much once again for joining us on this journey. We love you. Have a good night.